Continue his praise to the most high God, King of heaven and earth, even the God of our forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, and the God of Israel. To him and to him alone are all due praises. Brothers and sisters, we thank you for joining us for our Torah study. We are congregation Shomrei Habri, and we are the keepers of the covenant. We give thanks and praise to the most high God for all things, for everything. For even bringing us here in the approach of our holy Shabbat day. Um, we still got about another two hours here before um, our Sabbath starts, but we are going to have a great Torah study this evening. So brothers and sisters, we thank you for joining us and we remind you that your spiritual journey awaits. All right, brothers and sisters, I'm going to bring in my two guests for this evening. First, I'm going to bring in a Koyakia. I'm going to say peace and blessings to her. And also I'm going to bring in a specially invited guest, a co-eva. We're going to bring both of them in. Shabbat Shalom. How are you both doing? Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Amen. How's everybody doing? How was your week? Everything is great. Yeah, I'm finally ready for the weekend. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Listen, I, I'm always, I always look forward to the Sabbath day and things of that nature and getting some rest. Oko Yakia, how about yourself? My week was well. So I guess. Okay, all right, all right. I want to say Shabbat Shalom to Zipporah Levy. Um, may the Most High God continue to bless you. And I want to say Shabbat Shalom to Gaber Sarah. Most High God continue to bless you also. All right. I think this is one of them topics. <laughs> this is one of those things that we're going to need a whole lot of time for. So what I am going to tell everyone is, um, let's get straight to it. We are going to say a prayer. So I'm going to ask everyone to rise and face the east, and then we're going to get right to it. So everyone, please rise and face the east. Yehovah God, God of the heavens and God of our forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, and the God of Israel, we come before you on this holy, this holy Sabbath day which approaches to give you thanks, praise, honor, and glory for all things for everything, even for blessing us to even call upon your most high and most holy name. And even as we enter into our Torah study, we ask God that you bless us in such a way that we might understand, Yahweh God, the righteousness of the matter. That Yahweh God, even though we talk about things that may have become in this society a sensitive topic, that Yahweh God, we call upon you because we realize that we want to know what you desire for us to do in order that, Yahweh God, we might not profane or blaspheme your most high, your most holy name, and we might not break any of your commandments. Therefore, I ask that you endow the spirit of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding upon everyone who is speaking before you this night. I ask Yahweh God that you bring the righteousness into the chat so that Yahweh God, we can get good sound direction, Yahweh God. People who will praise and glorify you and cause us to understand how to walk before you. I ask Yahweh God that you cause us to speak with uh, uh, a clear mind, and that Yahweh God, we will give an acceptable answer for all things and everything that we do, so we can understand Yahweh God those things that you desire for us to do, so that we can know how you want us to move, and you we can know Yahweh God the path in which we should forsake that path that's not a good path, that wicked path, Yahweh God, so that when we see it, we would stop and we would say God is not there. I also ask God that you bless us in such a way that you might forgive us for all of our sins. Please forgive us for the sins that we commit for you. Have it to be, Yahweh God, that you might cause us to have a clean slate for you. Have it to be that your loving kindness, your tender mercy might always be upon us. And that, Yahweh God, when we see that you are forgiving God, for you are forgiving God, we wouldn't be afraid to thank you, to praise you, glorify you, to bend our knees and bow our heads and acknowledge that you are the true God of the universe. We call upon you because we realize that you are God and God alone and that beside you there's no other. All glory, all honor, and all praises unto your name now forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, please be seated. So continuous praise to the most high God, King of heaven and earth. 
even a God of our forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, and the God of Israel. To him and to him alone are all due praises. All right, brothers and sisters, I took down the fly, but I'm going to read it off for us as we get started. Um, our Torah study this evening will be concerning the topic of transgender. Is it time to command? And when we ask to command, command who, you might say? Command each other, command our children to take a stance on what's right and what's wrong. Our first top subtopic is, is it a boy or is it a girl? Our second subtopic is, does God create us confused? And our third subtopic is the righteousness of the situation. So we got a lot of things to talk about. Brothers and sisters in the chat, you are invited to join us in the chat. Please, it is always, uh, your participation is, is desired. I just ask everybody to make sure we're being respectful of one another and one another's views. And as we in, enter into the conversation, that it would um, enlighten us, edify us. So we could understand the different things that we need to do. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, my sister Eva, Eva, pronounced Kawa in Hebrew, right? Kawa, we're she all in the throat, Kawa. <laughs> Uh, she is my podcast partner and also a high school classmate of mine um, beneath the surface. And we've been doing a couple of different things together. And I asked her to come on um, to join us for this conversation because I know she has some great insight on a lot of different things. And usually it's a good conversation when we bring her along. And we're going to do something a little bit different this week. I'm going to let her facilitate the conversation to a degree. And you're going to hear from all three of us. You're going to hear from myself. You're going to hear from Koya Kia. You're going to also hear from Eva. And we're going to have this conversation. And I'm going to remind everybody, please join us, put your comments in the chat, and we'll go from there. So Eva, are you ready to uh, lead us into our conversation? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Let us go. Yeah. So there was a topic or a subtopic that you wanted to deal with first in terms of whether a person identifies as a boy or a girl. And for some reason, even though I'm not a parent, mm -hmm. the first thing that came to mind is I wonder how parents even keep up with the direction of the culture that mm -hmm. their kids are being raised into. So mm -hmm. when you're an adult, you've already been established in terms of your cultural identity and you've already come of age and pretty much determined who you are. But whatever a kid is born into, even if you have a holy household, mm -hmm. whatever a kid is born into culturally in their nation, in their world, and when I say nation, I use that term loosely, okay. uh, country as opposed to, you know, uh, the Israelite nation, but according to the country and the world they live in, that's normative to them. So the question is from, a, from just building families, uh, making sure that, you know, that we're doing right by, by the next generation. How can parents keep up with the cultural revolution that their kids are growing up in concerning gender and sexuality? Okay. Um, I'm going to take a stab at it before I ask Koyak here to make a comment. Um, the first thing I, I think, you know, as a man with five children, you stop, you look at your children and you see how they're developing. You know, it's like you, you're kind of watching who, how they move. You're watching who they find themselves around, right? And that begins before they start school. Then while they're in school, you, it's important for you to have those conversations. And it's, not, it's, it's important for you to have those conversations culturally because when you understand other people's cultures, then you will understand what your children should and shouldn't be around. Right. So there's a couple of things that we already know that we're not going to have our kids involved with because we were involved in it. Um, we're going to stop and be like, all right, um, what were y'all doing in school? Oh, they had a Halloween party. OK, time to sit down and talk to them about that. Um, oh, what was what happened in school? Oh, well, um, we're preparing for the Thanksgiving um, party and they gave us coloring sheets coloring worksheets to do it. So, you know, if you got three turkeys and you got uh, two pilgrims, how many do you have all together? You know, you see it and you see the influence. Um, 
in years past, I don't think we've ever talked about, I'm not gonna say we've ever talked about, I don't think it's been a focus to necessarily talk about sexuality. Because for kids, you don't want to lead them in too quick, right? Yep. However, with curriculum changing and things going on in the world, what ends up happening is now they're introducing new books that when you go through your kid, your child's book bag, when you go through your teenagers and you see what they're doing, they're like, okay, what are they teaching in class? Oh, um, they were telling us that there's a new rainbow curriculum. Interesting. What is that about? And I think that opens the conversation. So, Koyaki, do you have anything for that? Yes. You know, I like to use the Holy Scriptures as a reference of everything that's going around today. And when it comes down to, you know, the transgender, is it a boy or is it a girl? I use how the Most High created us a certain way. And mm -hmm how certain things that's normal to today's society wasn't normal back then. I will use Solomon and Gomorrah. I will use certain scriptures, how the most high has called, will cause confusion due to captivity. So now we're in a confused state. We don't know what it is and how do I teach my child how to identify whether or not it's a girl or a boy. I actually had this conversation with my son when he said, what is that? Hmm. You know, I couldn't identify what it was. So I had to tell him, you know, the most high do certain things to people mentally sometimes. And it causes them to change. And sometimes we don't have an answer of why these things happen. Some people say, well, it's a mental, um, it's a mental breakdown. Something happened in the past. Something happened to them as they were a child. They was molested or things of that nature that caused a mental confusion. So I try to use, this is not what the most high want us to be. This is how it should be on their level. If I'm talking to a, a teenager like my daughter, we can get into it on her level and she can understand what's going on. Yeah, so one thing that I noticed that both of you are doing and saying which is so important is involvement and communication and even teaching critical thinking and engaging young people as opposed to your kid comes, comes home from school and it's like, okay, commands, go do this, go do that, finish your homework, go take a bath, go to bed, and then there's nothing. In this day and age, we have to engage them and be deliberate and ask open-ended questions, right? so that they're not just answering yes, no, to appease dad or mom, you know? So, so yeah, it's, that, that's really powerful that both of you all just said, we're, co we're communicating, we're talking, you know? Right. So that the, the child feels open to say, well, I didn't understand this, or this is what I noticed. And, and that's what really builds strong families. But why is gender so important? Sometimes people will say, you know, we're just consciousness, and spirits occupying these bodies, you know, just for the purpose of having this human experience. So what difference does gender really make? What? Gender is crucial, especially when you're finding a mate. Some people find a mate, a male, but it was originally a, a female. And they find out later on and it causes conflict, it causes Sometimes that person is, is going to die. Is that betrayal? That's betrayal, yes. Yeah. You know, I come into this situation thinking you was this, but you're that, and that's wrong. And now I know, now I know that I have to go the other way. So it's a form of betrayal, yes. And I'm going to say, you know, um, God found it important for us to identify each other differently. God found it important for us to not only identify by our anatomy, but also identify by our clothing. Okay. He told us, he said, a man shall not wear a woman's garments, neither shall a woman wear that which pertains to a man. 
Why is that a commandment if it wasn't important? And I always say it stretches beyond clothes. You know, men that wear lipstick, what's happening there? Men that wear makeup. And now we're getting to this point where makeup is a very uh, broad term, right? Because it's like, there's your makeup and there's my makeup. And, you know, we're kind of like, yeah. You know, I, I always say, um, what's that? That store, Bath and Body Works, popular store here in New York City. There was a point it was only, only for women. Then the men's section creeped in. But the men's section looks like the women's section. Right. What are we doing and how are we doing it? And is it important for us to identify as a boy or a girl? I say it's monumental, no, no doubt about it. I should not have to ask you if you were previously something else. Okay. I should be able to look at you identify you and say, okay, this is what it is. I can look at an elder and say, that's an elder. I can look at a child and say, that's a child. So why shouldn't I be able to look at a boy and say, that's a boy, or look at a girl and say, that's a girl? But what do we have now? Um, do you want to identify as Mr., Miss, Mrs., or no identification, mm -hmm. right? They're changing, they're changing the resumes, they're changing the applications, they're, cha they're changing the whole gambit, right? After to accommodate for this. And we know we're confused by it because we're like, okay, how do I deal when the reality is I shouldn't have to go through that much. I can understand a prepubescent child, right? Because they're growing into their body, they're growing into their face, things of their nature. You know, some boys, they have um, high voices at first, but it is, it is a long, long standing, a long standing understanding about this that men have deeper voices, women have higher voices. Okay. Come on, so, go. So, so, so there are a couple of things. The first thing is you mentioned, both of you all mentioned the Torah, right? And Torah actually has commandments about these things. Yeah. And so what immediately comes to mind when I hear that is that why would Yah have a commandment if these things weren't going on? Correct. And so it is, it is interesting that um, a lot of times we'll say, well, these are modern, this is a modern phenomena, but why would a commandment come to a group of people at a particular time, unless there was a need for that commandment. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, nevertheless, why is why is our body so important as to uh, induce a commandment? Um, aren't you, Moray? Aren't both? Aren't all three of us human beings first? Of course. And and guess what? The way you look incites feeling. I want us to remember that. How you're presented incites feeling, makes me think, hey, listen, this is this is somebody I like, this is somebody I don't like. This is why. The way you present yourself makes me consider the type of person that you are, right? What your role is in life. And I know we like to get away from that word roles, but what your role is in life, what it should be and what it shouldn't be. And so I ask, I ask us this, and I know we, we are not animals, but are, are animals identified as male and female? They sure are. Of course they are. We understand I mean, like that's what, and how do they identify as such? For what? Procreation. But I know I'm about to reach into another bag that we might get away from in a minute. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's jump into the, the initial question though. Is it a boy or a girl, right? So okay. what, what seems to be happening uh, a lot of times, especially when people are younger, but even Bruce Jenner and some of the older people who are making gender, who are doing gender reassignment surgeries is that um, they know how they feel. Mm -hmm. they know, and then they juxtapose that against what society says about the way they should look and the way they should act. And they see a difference there. And so it's a good question to ask, what is a boy and what is a girl? Is it something that we 
are getting, is this a, is this a, a sociological construct that we're getting from society that says, this is the way you should dress and behave? Is this something we're getting from Torah? You know, where is that coming from? Because what that tends to do, I think that provokes the gender reassignment surgery because a, 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 ma a so-called masculine girl who likes to run out and play uh, and, and is told, no, you should be playing with those dolls might say, well, let me change into that boy that I need to be in order to right. run out and play. And so what is a boy and what is a girl? And is it possible people are making these life altering decisions because there's a difference between how they feel and what society says? Mm -hmm. I'll call you Ikea. Um, I had to look up what a transgender and a transsexual was. Mm. And I didn't know it was a huge difference. So the transgender going to what the question asks, is it a boy or is it a girl? When you're originally born in your form, you start developing feelings of the opposite sex. So now you want to have these um, physical changes done to be the transsexual. Now I'm a girl because that's the way I felt, although I'm a boy. So it has something to do with the feelings. Although you can say, no, you're a boy. This, you have these boy parts, but deep down inside, the person doesn't feel that way. So they want to transform. So now they identify themselves as a girl. But do we have the right to do that? Do, do I have the right tomorrow to stop and say, no, don't, don't, don't identify me as a male anymore. Identify me as a female. Do I have the right to do that in spite of the fact that I haven't had gender reassignment surgery? And I'm saying that because there's some things where, you know, we're putting into the mind of impressionable children that are growing up and trying to find their way in life that they're like, I don't know what I feel like. Maybe I want to do both. You didn't, didn't think about that one yet, right? Yeah. You think about the person that wants to be the boy girl or the girl boy, however you want to pronounce it. Do I have the right to wake up tomorrow and say, I can't identify, I, this is how I choose to identify. Knowing that God created me a certain way, knowing that God blessed me with certain things. Right. And so I ask us this question because we deal with these things and I like um, a Coke Kaza statement. She said, it's in the pharmaceutical medicines and foods. They are changing biological chemistry Check your soybeans. Watch what's happening there. Also, childhood trauma contributes. This is my own opinion and perspective, right? Brother Matt Smith says that that infamil makes them flamboyant. Talking about the boys. There's some things. I understand where he's coming from. I don't know if that has been proved um, through, through, through research, my brother Matt. But what I am going to say is like the soybeans, it is known to produce high levels of estrogen and men as well as in women, right? And now people are, men are becoming a little bit more aware about tofu and what? It's side effects. So I'm telling us to keep that in mind. If we have certain foods that are affecting our bodies in certain ways, well, if you're giving that to a child, and the child sees his body developing a certain way, then they, the child might be asking themselves, well, how come I'm developing this way? But this person who's supposed to be a boy and who is a boy is developing another. And sometimes our children are going, there's things happening in their mind that they're thinking about that they don't reveal to us. Till well, later. How much room though do parents give their children to be individuals? For example, getting back to the previous example, if there's a little girl who likes to climb trees and she likes to be out in nature, mm, boy. parents al allowing her to be who she is without saying you're behaving like a boy or those are masculine characteristics. Because if they do, in a few years, she's gonna start reaching conclusions about who she is when in fact she's a perfectly fine 
girl who likes to to go out into nature and play in in nature. So so at, at what point, like how much room? Because there has to be a line somewhere. But at how much room uh, do parents give their children, or should parents give their children about um, what their activities can be, and if it's appropriate for someone of their sex? Oh yeah, Katie, you want to take a stab at that before I go? No, go ahead. Mama. So here's the thing. You know, you heard me use the term tomboy. Um, you're identifying that this is a girl who is showing some, some boy behavior. And even in being a tomboy, our parents, they corrected us. They said, this is what you should be doing. This is why you should be doing it this way. This is, you can't do this as what? A young lady, right? You shouldn't be climbing up on trees. You shouldn't be doing all. Now we have it where it's like, oh, listen, whether it's a boy or whether it's a girl, it's okay, it's okay to do these things. But clearly women don't have the same physical attributes as men. That's why it's been identified a certain way. That's why you still don't to this day, they, to, to the best of their ability, they're trying to get it done. But when it comes to pro, professional football, women, women still can't play it. I think the best they got was a was a kicker, was a punter. Why is that? I think it was the kicker, not even the punter. Because the, the kicker, except for the kickoff, they don't have to be on the field that long. But there's some things that women shouldn't just be involved in. A boy shouldn't be involved in. A girl shouldn't be involved in. So when they're displaying this behavior, I take us back to my initial comments where you watch the child. You see how they move. What are things that boys do that girls don't do? Well, guess what? You might see your brother sitting there with his legs wide open, but as a little girl, close your legs, right? He shouldn't have his legs wide open either, but especially you, right? There's a way to do that. You shouldn't be jumping around and doing all the things that they are doing because it's noted. Boys should be rough and tough and things of that nature. And they're going to have some bumps and bruises. Does it mean that as a girl, you can't have fun? Does it mean you can't, you know, some girls will be tougher than others. But it's still important to be what? Ladylike. I say that because also for boys, sometimes you might have to tell your boy, you like, hey, listen, I think you're spending too much time around your mother. Or, I, um, and when I say too much time around your mother, I use that term loosely where your, your behavior is becoming like that, this. Um, you know, boy, boy, <laughs> say this. <laughs> you know, don't walk around the house in your mother sh with your mother's shoes on, right? What are you doing right there? Take those shoes off. That's not something for you to do, right? Um, I talk about makeup and things of that nature. Um, you shouldn't be in the bathroom playing with your mother's beauty products, right? All those, all those things take place. I, I even say to the point, we wear earrings. There's, there's female earrings and there's male earrings. And you know, that's, again, I could open up a big can on that one, <laughs> but I won't at this time. So, of course, it's important. You watch how they develop. You see what they're into. You see if he's a little too feminine, right? You see, some, and sometimes men know it. He's like, there's sometimes where you got to toughen your boy up some. You're, you're crying too much. You're complaining too much. Everything is you whining. Girls do that. Boys don't do that, right? Because what happens is, is the more they have that, what we call energy, right? The more that energy stays in that side, the more you may find yourself leaning over there. But come on. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, I really have no, oh no, go ahead. Go ahead okay. I was gonna say that their environment, you know, plays a good part of it. If my child, my daughter is always around boys, of course, you're going to pick up boy things, you know, boys' habits. So I have to tell her, this is not what we do. 
this is where you need to be, who you need to be around. And for my sons, like he said earlier, being really emotional, um, doing things that my daughters is doing, they gotta be separated. So they know there is a difference, um, how they act, how they think, you know, the things that they do. Um, girls do this, boys don't do these things, you know, and vice versa on that. But the environment um, also plays a role in it because if you don't show that change, they can be confused and think it's normal. So at an mm -hmm. early age, you know, get it when they're early. So as they grow, they can understand the difference and the roles they have to play. And how do you ensure you're not crushing their spirit? Mm -hmm. How do you, when I, uh, so for example, there's some things that aren't, that are pretty gender neutral. For example, playing the piano. Somebody might disagree with that, but you know, we'll just, we'll just hold on to that for a minute. It's a, it's a musical instrument, right? The piano. And, um, you know, there, there could be a father who said, who, who had in his mind his entire life, my son is going to play football. That's the type of son I'm going to have. Yeah. The son pops out <laughs> and the son gravitates to the piano <laughs> and God forbid the violin, right? And so we know Mr. Farrakhan plays the violin. So, you know, and so again, um, we want to make sure because, you know, when you, when you're raising your children, they're, they're. Uh, scriptures that uh, Rory already could probably cite off the mm -hmm. top about raising them up to be who they were designed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we make sure we're not crushing their spirit, um, but still having those restrictions? And that's really the last thing I wanted to bring up about the subtopic number one, um, because uh, otherwise sometimes we're putting boundaries on what a boy is and what a girl is that, that may be subjective to what we expected of our sons and daughters. So when it comes down to mm -hmm. things being unisex, I, I agree with you. You could, yes, tell them boys and girls can do these things, but in a certain manner. So they won't feel, okay, a boy does it like this. I should do it like this as well. Like you said, playing a musical instrument. You may have a boy who may play it, I don't know, a feminine way but it can be altered into a masculine way. You know, do it like this, son, because your daughter, your, your sister plays it like this. And you don't, I guess, want them to be confused. All right. Uh, listen, y'all trying to get me started. <laughs> I'm gonna get this. Listen, do we play drums? I said, I'm sitting there looking at my son. You yeah. go play those drums, but where do you go? You go to pick up the top Miriam. You go to pick up that timbrel, and you like, shh, shh. it's like, um, no. No. <laughs> you play drums. Oh, but I like the sound. No. no. You play drums. I buy my children toys. I buy my daughter's dolls. I buy my son's sports equipment. I bought the football helmet for you not for her, right? I bought the boxing gloves for you, not for her, right? She has dolls, I bought her a tea set. I'm just gonna tell you, it's the type of man that I am. If my son comes and asks me to buy him a tea set, then I'm gonna sit down and say, it's time for us to have a conversation. And what so about did you, right? What about a keyboard? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, like a, a musical instrument besides uh, percussions like drums. Right. Well, listen, this this is what I'm going to tell you. You know, my, my thing about music is there's there's certain certain parts of the instruments that are definitely feminine. Then there's others that's like, OK, they can be gender neutral. Right. So keyboard, that's fine. You might like the sound of a keyboard, but you know how they make you know how they make this stuff these days. You can buy it where you can purchase a pink keyboard. The pink keyboard is for who? Girl. The girl. I'm like, listen, let's stop. Let's talk about it. Let's get to it. Let's admit it for what it is. That, that is who it's being catered to. When you go in a toy store, you still see toy sections that are girls, that are boys. I remember somebody trying to tell me as a kid, they was like, I said, I don't play with dolls. And they were like, you play with dolls? That G.I. Joe, those Transformers, those are just male dolls. And I was like, no, they're not. 
They're action figures, right? They're harder <laughs> than down. I was looking. I was like, let me get out of this real quick. Ain't no dolls. <laughs> Girls play with dolls. Girls do uh, the, the hair of the doll, right? They braid their hair and stuff like that. All that stuff goes on. But I'm looking at my son. I'm like, why are you braiding hair? Why, why are you gravitating to that? Because there's things that should be for you. Because just like a Bruce Jenner, who later on in life, I mean, Bruce Jenner lived the majority of his life as a male. He's still living now, but he lived the majority of his life as a male, the better, the better part of it. And then he came along and he said, I want to be a female. World-class Olympian, world-class. Now, gender reassignment, and they're telling us, they're telling you it's a choice. Well, why did you decide to be a male the majority of your life? What made you decide to do that? And so I'm going to say this before I let um, one of you two get in, that that's that difference of, and I said this um, in the beginning, and... I'm going to put up the banner for a second. Transgender, is it time to command? There's a point we get to, brothers and sisters, where somebody needs to say something. Somebody got to say something about something. It can't just be a thing. It cannot just be a thing where you're like, well, you know what? Mm, I'm going to change my gender tomorrow. And we're getting, can I be a male for like 30 years, a female for 10, and then jump back to a male for the rest of my life? Can that work out like that? Does that not sound to us like confusion? And I'm saying that because once we let that creep into our children's minds, then we begin to start to get away from what God intended when he created us. Sister Nasira is asking some really good questions. All right, let's put it up. Let's get to it. Nasira is one of my congregants. I like what she's talking about. Is he not going to help with his children doing their hair, especially when mom can't? Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, Sister Nasira, now let me just tell y'all something. Sister Nasira is very much a comedian. I'm just going to tell y'all this right now. So she's somewhere, she's serious about the question, but she's laughing, right? She's like, well, he's not going to help if the care got to be done and this, that, and another. Um, this is where the village comes in, Sister Nasira. Why is there not somebody who I can pay to do my child's hair? Why is there not somebody who is willing to help to say, hey, listen, I see he's over there and he's by himself and you know, she's a girl. That's where the village comes in. Girls helping girls, females helping females. Another adult woman saying, okay, no problem. I'll take care of that. You might not get something extravagant, but you get something that works. Now, I get it. We're coming out of slavery and we ain't fresh out of slavery. So I'll remind us of this. We'll come out of slavery so not everybody can always pay and things of that nature. But there should be a point like we should want to help one another when we see each other down. But it shouldn't get to a point where I feel I have to learn to do my child's hair because nobody else will help me. But am I going to judge a man because he's combing his own daughter's hair? Or a mother who will put the bowl on top of the little boy's head and and cut around it. And, I, got and <laughs> I, got, I got a problem with that. Um, what do you call it? Barrettes and bobos and yes. beads and things of that nature. Um, that has always been female stuff. Has always been the case. Um, I know there's been much of the conversation about our beads definitively um, there, but we do we do read and you know I'm not trying to give y'all no ammunition. Boys are boys and girls are girls, but we do read about Absalom in our scriptures. 
And he cut off his hair. He had so much hair, he cut off what? Like a shekel's weight every year. That's how much his hair grew. And right before he died, he had his hair on what we call an updo or something of that nature. So do I believe he had a bow ball around it though? It's one thing for you to tie your hair back. You know, as men, we wore braids. We wear braids, excuse me. We wear locks, things of that nature. We do use things to hold them back. But what a woman uses to hold her hair back and what a man uses to hold his hair back should be two entirely different things. It should be clearly identifiable. And guess what? Me and my wife shouldn't be swapping, you know, things that we put in our hair. Oh, you got an extra barrette? What are we doing here? What's, what, what's happening? That stuff, that, that stuff is strange. But um, I digress. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, after, so, so again, it's just really. We, I think, it's important to make a distinction between the gender roles that are assigned by human beings in society versus what is assigned in Torah. And so, I think that that ultimately answers the question of what a boy is and what a girl is, uh, because I think the 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 rebellion that comes in, and the confusion that comes in, sometimes is a rebellion against something that really isn't in scripture. It's just mm-hmm. what society mm-hmm. says is normative. And I think one way to avoid that is, is really to just stick what to what scripture says. But mm-hmm. you had subtopic number two. Uh, I just want to adjust this quick fast and I want to make sure. Um, and uh, a coat Ruach, Shabbat Shalom, sis, says, I think she was meaning a woman cutting their son's hair. Is that what you were referring to? Yeah, yeah, I was saying, you know how you put a bowl over, B-O-W-L, over a boy's head and you cut around it and then you give him his little haircut. Of course, it's embarrassing to the end of time for the boy, but some women don't know how to cut hair. And if the man, if the husband is not there, is it wrong for her to try to give him as much of a shape up as she can (laughs) simply because she's a woman? What? What? I'm gonna say I'm gonna revert back to the village. I'm gonna revert back to the village. It should be that if that's not my son and I know how to cut hair and I see that somebody's struggling, my, my mother never cut my hair. She she sent me to <laughs> She sent me to the barber. She was like, here's this. I understand the, the times have changed. She yeah. said, here's the money. Go get your hair cut. She took me at first into the barber shop. Then she started pointing to me. There's, there's the barber shop. So I'm, all I'm going to say is, and you know, we're, we're at this point, right? Again, I'm not going to judge you if you cut your son's hair. But listen, put braids in your son's hair. Some locks in his head, things of that nature, you know. Just go for man, like you know, do what you do. But um, sit, listen, and and I mean this. Learn to send your boys to be around men. Learn to send your girls to be around ladies, okay. not just women, but ladies. Send send them to be around men so that he understands how to act around them, how to be around them. You know how many children I see because they've been around that feminine energy for so long, once they get around other boys, other other men, other, you know, other males, they don't know how to act anymore because they never had somebody to teach them along the way to say, yeah, you do this or no, you don't do this. So I keep that in mind, but I'm like, you know, a woman, you know, Send your son to the barber shop. This is 2022. <laughs> what are we doing right now? Have you got a neighbor? Talk to your neighbor. You know, it's like, hey, listen, can you send my son to the barber shop? This is why. And don't be cheap. Make sure, you know, it's, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay, I'm sorry. We're going to um get to our next subtopic. I'm sorry, Koyaki, did you have something for there? Okay. Better call call. Mm-hmm. All right. So does God create us confused? Create oh us confused. Jesus. 
And, you know, usually skeptics, I love, skeptics really love to ask questions like this. They'll look at the result of something going on, you know, within a child or within a person. And then they'll say, well, let's blame it on God. You right. Know, why, why would God create a person in a particular way and then not expect them to act on it? And I think that's a really good question. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying about the difference between what God's expectations for gender is versus what society is, society's expectation is. And so, Akot, have you found that uh, you've had to correct your kids to follow what God is saying as opposed to the norms that they see in society? Yes. Um, actually, my, my daughter was exposed to a person who, she was exposed to a person, and I have to correct her on that. Um, your friends should be just like you. You know, I don't want them around people who want to experiment. You know, let's let's try this. Or what do you think about this? Those friends are a no no. The Most High created us the way He wanted us to be. And when I think about that, I ask myself: Is it a mental problem that they have when they feel like the Most High made a mistake? You know, and they tell their parents, "I think God meant for me to be a girl." And you have to ask yourself, well. How do I handle that? How do I digest in them? No, the most high made you a boy. Well, I don't feel that way. God made a mistake in trying to fight with that, fight with your feelings and their feelings and, and what God says. It could be a tug of war because you can say whatever you want to your child. If they decide to do what they want to do, what can you do about it? Yeah. Yeah. About it. There was a person. I believe it was a boy. I think it was a girl. The person looked like a boy. I, I, they were going through um, this change throughout their life. It was confused about what they were. Mm -hmm. They had um, certain, they had mixed feelings. And at the end of the day, the parent says, what do you want to be? Although they was born with both parts. How mm -hmm. do you pick which one you want to be when you're born with both parts. And is that being confused? And then they ask, did God make a mistake when they, I was born like this? What, what do you say about that? And then you choose the wrong part. Yeah, and I think that goes back to the type of influence that parents have in the household because there are some parents that honestly say, um, I'm not going to stick my kid under a rock. They're going to be exposed to all of this anyway. So I'll let them be exposed now instead of realizing that there's really a choice that you're making. Either you influence your kid or the world will. And, uh, you know, so it's not like you're putting your kid under the rock, under a rock and um, and not exposing them to what the, they're going to be exposed to the world anyway. So it's really important as parents for us to influence uh, them because they're going to end up having to make a decision and strike that balance anyway. And so that's where like the, the confusion comes in. I think when a lot of people don't take the responsibility that was given them as guardians of these younger people and saying, Oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put them under a rock, just let the world and let them decide. Um, that's where a lot of the confusion comes in. What do you think, Moray? So I think we don't give ourselves enough credit. And I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to some extremes here. So I'm just letting y'all know right now. Prepare yourselves. <laughs> do you allow your Do you allow your children to be thieves? You don't take the the approach to say, "Well, you know, I would hope they wouldn't be a thief, but if they are, then so be it." No, you say that's unacceptable. Do you allow them to be murderers? Do you allow your your sons to? participate in domestic violence and things of that nature. You stop being like, no, that's unacceptable. For you to for you to be beaten on women is unacceptable. For you to steal things from people, that's unacceptable. For you to sell drugs and to take drugs, these things are unacceptable. These things cannot exist. 
right? And we put our foot down. So I ask us, why are we not putting our foot down in this in these areas? Well, let me answer that question. And that is, is that right now we're coming into a society that is saying that there is nothing wrong um, with the fluidity over the lifetime of gender and sexuality. Gender identity and sexuality is fluid. Mm -hmm. you're a child, you might feel like you're heterosexual. By the time you're Bruce Jenner's age, you might feel like you're bisexual. You might want to be a girl when you're younger and a, and, a, and, a, and a male when you're older, and that's perfectly fine. And so that's the, the issue is that some people would take, uh, would take issue with, with comparing these topics with murder and, and thievery. Well, here's what I'm saying. And I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I don't want you to think that I don't understand what you're saying, and I get it. These are societal standards. However, we have to be a people that in spite of the societal standards, we have to be ones to say, no, that's, that is not how you can operate. And we can ill afford to allow our children to assimilate into a culture that is anti-Torah, that is anti-God. God is already speaking about these things. So even though even though society says, yeah, you can do this and you can do that. And you can dibble and dabble a little bit into this. And this is why. And it won't make you less of a person. It won't make you less of a person to them. But are you less of a person in the eyes of God? Now, we have laws that say that if a man is crushed in his privy parts, that he should be excluded from the house of the Lord. And this is why. You know, this, this is the amount of time. And this is why. So when we, when we have situations like that, we have to learn to teach our children that you can't just look at what man is saying is okay. You must take that into balance and say, what does God say is okay? And you have to hold the word of God in higher weight than to man's understanding. So it's the job of parents to do that. It's the job of mentees to do that and the, and the job of uh, people mm -hmm. in the community to encourage others who are going through this confusion instead of just leaving it alone. Well, I think, I think we need to understand that children start off confused. <laughs> life imitates life. You, before you know what a boy is, you're just moving around doing things. Somebody has to tell you, you're a boy. You're a girl. You do this. You don't do this. I say one, one of the main, listen, there's something that happens. Your children begin to follow you around, right? All of you have children. They follow you everywhere. You, you make it your business to train them that they follow you everywhere. Then there's sometimes where you're like, you can't follow me in here right now. Right? You can't go over here. Wait here until I come back. Now you have to make it clear to them when is the time that you follow me and when is the time that you don't? I say all the time, when it's time for us to shower, sit down, you're like, hey, listen, you stay here until I come back, right? And that, that's fine because then now you, have, now you make the separation after you get to a certain age, you, you say, this is what this is, this is what this is not. I had to learn after following my mother around that when my mother gets dressed, I have to wait someplace else, right? Until she'll come back to get me, but it's there. I say that because when we talk about our confusion, that's what establishes, oh, guess what? Boys shouldn't be dressing around females and females shouldn't be dressing around boys or males shouldn't be dressing around uh, females and females shouldn't be dressing around males. That's what establishes these lines. Sometimes people are confused because nobody has made it clear to them what you're thinking is right or what you're thinking is wrong. Yeah. So I wanted to bring up uh, some celebrities uh, very briefly because what, what's going on in this conversation is that we are talking about practical things that can be done. And so everybody knows about the basketball star Dwayne Wade, who's married to Gabrielle Union mm -hmm. and they're, they're, son, I believe he started off as, right? 
you know, yeah. has decided not not only has decided that he is or not decided, but has expressed that he is gay, but then wanted to march in a parade. And then after that, mm -hmm. wanted to actually change physically, change hormonally and physically his gender. And so now I forgot what the what his name is now as a girl it begins with a Z, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as a parent, as parents, and, and not just parents, because I don't want to just point to children since, again, older people, especially baby boomers who have spent their entire lives feeling like there's something else. And now they're able to actually do surgeries like that. Baby boomers are doing it as well. But the point is, if you have a friend or if you have a child or a mentee who is just really, really heartbroken mm -hmm. over that they feel, it's called gender dys dysphoria, they feel different physically than what they present as. And they're just coming to you, I need to do something about this, otherwise I, I don't want to live anymore and that sort of thing. You know, how, what what can, can be said to that person to alleviate that confusion? Mm -hmm. So first thing I'm going to say is, um, you know, Dwayne, first thing I'm going to say is Dwayne, the name of Dwayne, Dwayne Wade's son is Zaire Wade. Zaire. Mm -hmm. um, interesting that that's the name. Um, second thing is that we're going to have to understand that education and communication, education and communication alleviates a lot of these things. Also, at the same time, too, is we have to begin to ask ourselves, is there a root? Is there a root cause that stops and says, this is why this person is dealing with this, or this is why this person is dealing with that? I don't think every person chooses, every person that chooses a homosexual lifestyle is based on they were born, they woke up, and that's how they felt. Um, I see in the chat, and I agree, some people have dealt with traumas that as a result, they can no longer have a normal experience, right? Some people have dealt with traumas that when they look at the opposite sex, the idea of that happening jumps back into their mind. And so this is their way of fighting. This is their way of fighting against all of that trauma that existed. And people like that need to heal but we have to address the situation. Does God create us confused? And so when I hear these things and I see these things, there are things that we can do to help our children to eliminate the confusion. And part of the reason that they're confused is because there's things that they are looking at that they should never have seen in the first place. All right. We can't get away from that. There are certain things that you have to stop and say to yourself, children shouldn't be looking at this. There's a why. Why is this happening like this? And what is going on? And that's because there's somebody who's pushing an, pushing an agenda. There's somebody who wants to normalize what's abnormal. And as a result, now they're beginning to question what they are, who they are, and what they should be a part of. And when that happens, that's that that only comes with you telling your child, yes, this is right, this is wrong, or no, that doesn't really matter. I always say it's like, listen, at, at one point, your child is gonna ask the question, how did I get here? How do we get here? Sometimes your child sees that their mother is pregnant. Right? How did you get pregnant? <laughs> Everything ain't gonna be, oh, mommy has a baby in her stomach. Well, how'd the baby get there? What's going on? Now, are you gonna have that type of conversation with a three-year-old? Absolutely not. And don't don't you dare expose the child to something like that too early. But when children are going through puberty right, when they're becoming teenagers, then it's time to have conversations like that. Why? Because, and I'm telling y'all right now, and Eva said it earlier in the conversation, 
you're going to have to get yourself to the point that if you're not teaching them, I guarantee you somebody in school is teaching them. I guarantee you they might have a friend that comes to the house that you're looking at the friend and you're like, hmm, I wonder. And you ask your child about the friend and what do they say? And we have these conversations, right? Um, sorry, one second. I got it. Okay, good. Um, that you're like, oh, they, they come and tell you, oh no, they're harmless. They don't do anything. You know, they're, they're just nice people. All right, it's not allowing me to block the last one. Okay. Okay. It's just it, it's the the page is refreshing. It's okay. Got a little spam going on over here. Don't worry. Yeah. Um so when that happens, is listen, you don't think it's important that you watch the friends you keep? Um my my teacher and my mentor, he always said this. He's like, um, when you have friends who don't serve God, and listen, it happens. Somebody's influencing somebody. So he chose the route, which I don't, I'm not mad at. I'm just like, I don't know if that's necessary. He said, I don't have friends who are not Israelites. All my friends are Israelites. Now, of course, I'm, I'm of the opinion, I'm like, there's no way that other people find out about who the Israelites are and what we do, unless, unless we find ourselves around people who don't serve God and positively, positively influence them. So I say all of that to say, because as time goes on and we look at everything that's happening, that the company you keep. You know, God tells us in the book of Isaiah, chapter one, he said, has this house of mine become a house of um, robbers and thieves, a den of robbers and thieves? So obviously perception is important. It's there. Our, our priest, he had to present himself a certain way. It's just how it was. He wore a robe, he wore a linen tunic, right? He he wore a turban, all of these things we had. So I say that because, um, and I mean this when I say this, don't think your children will just figure it out. It doesn't work out like that. They may figure it out, they may not figure it out. And we can ill afford, especially the way the world is going right now. And I know I keep using that word ill afford, but I need the job at this point at home. We can ill afford to wait for our children and hope that they will understand that which is right and that's what, what that which God wants when the world is teaching them to um to to um what's the name? To, to believe and look at things a certain way according to how they think they should believe. And I paused on that because, um, and I believe I sent this to the both of you, but if I haven't, you guys will let me know and after our Torah study, we'll go through it. Did y'all see they're trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, did y'all see that they're trying to change the word slavery out of history books and now term it as involuntary reassignment? No, I didn't. I didn't get that. <laughs> I didn't get that from you. I got to get that over to y'all. I was like, involuntary reassignment. How cute. Or was it involuntary servitude? Either way, it's it's still. It's slavery. Well, yeah, yeah, so. why, why is the push and, to change these words? And, and I don't want to get into that. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that. And that's the danger, right? The danger of of not being responsible over mm -hmm. um, the guardianship that people have been given to 
our families and to people in our lives. Like it's when you're in relationship with someone that, that there's a responsibility there, you know, to, yes. to, to make a distinction between truth and error, mm-hmm. especially when they're impressionable. So it's just, it, so it's actual irresponsibility to shirk it and say, you know, I want, I want my kids to determine who, what God they're going to serve. You know, I want them to determine what they want to do with their life. I think it's important, again, not to crush a kid's spirit or a person's spirit because um, God, I don't think God created clones for everybody to be exactly the same. Um, But there still has to be uh, some kind of guidance because otherwise, what's the purpose of of, of somebody being born into a household? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, kid, did you have something? Oh, maybe not. So, This is the thing, and I like this comment about assuaging their guilt, right? And she's talking about that in reference to slavery and trying to give a different yeah. word. But, um, you know, we are trying to use new terminology to influence people, right? According to how we think. But the reality is the reality is for us as a people, when we see transgender individuals, did God create this classification of people? Or did man create the classification? You know, so yeah. And, and I know that, you know, the subtopic number three is more related to what Torah says in response to these things. Mm-hmm. And I think that you know, this being a Torah study, we'll probably spend the majority of the time on that. Um, but the first thing, but I wanted to say something to you know anybody who might be watching, who I think are probably all Israelites, but you never know because you did get that spam. Yeah. So, <laughs> so anybody, anybody watching who might be like Torah, look, like automatically, I'm not listening. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. The reality of the matter for skeptics is this. It's important to have a spiritual worldview. Yes. It's important to have a worldview, a spiritual worldview, as opposed to having nothing to guide your life whatsoever. And if you're going to be led by what Taurus or God, by what God says through Torah, then let's see what, how it responds to even issues of the modern day. So what was subtopic number three? The top right. topic number three is? Yep, the righteousness of the situation or lack thereof, right? Mm-hmm. So I know you have these scriptures off the top of your head. <laughs> and so, so let's, That's let's, my let's, job. Come on. <laughs> let's see what's really going on. Let's see what answer Torah provides. You know, even for uh-huh. people who do not follow, you want to know what answers exist. So let's see what Torah says. What were you going to say, Moray? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously the word transgender is not in Torah. It's not in the Holy Scriptures. So you cannot take that approach to say, well, transgender doesn't exist in the scriptures because transgender is, is a word they just made up. It's, it's something recent, the cur- current century, if not millennia, right? And so I say these things because it's more for us to understand, brothers and sisters, that God created things a certain way. And I always take us back to Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve, Adam looked and he saw how the animals came to him and God caused him to name the animals. And he said, I don't have somebody comparable. And so when that happens, we have to stop and say to ourselves, oh, well, hey, hmm, look at this here. If Adam saw that he didn't have a match and he wasn't, he didn't have all these outside influences and God created something for him that was opposite of him, even though he took one of his ribs to create it, then we must begin to consider about how the first man to traverse this earth looked at how everything was spanning itself out. 
Adam wasn't confused. Matter of fact, he said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, oh, there's another brother like me. Let's call him Adam, <laughs> right? Adam too, or Adam Bait. No, he said, her name will be Kawa. And why was her name Kawa? Because she will be the mother of all living. So I say that to us because the righteousness of the situation says that, hey, listen, God created us all differently. This has been the mode of life since the beginning of time. I could sit here and give a whole speech on Sodom and Gomorrah, but we already know what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah because of the level of homosexuality. And uh, let me take, a, take out that word level because of the homosexuality that was going on in, that, in those cities, God destroyed them. He burned them by fire. I can tell you that God has already told us that Man shall not lie down with man as he lies down with woman, for that is perversion. That's an abomination, right? God doesn't want us laying with the same sex, neither does he want us laying with beasts. So if you're a man who decides to change his sex, that doesn't stop you from being a man. You're a man who now calls himself a woman. You're a man who mutilated himself to make sure that he looks like a woman. You're a man who has taken uh, hormones, because that's what happens, so you can start to develop like a woman. But you'll never be able to do what a woman does. You'll never be able to give life. Even if they have now where you can take the organs of a woman and put it onto a man and have it exist with the hormones that you take, you'll never be a woman, because that's not what God supplied you with. So the family that's on TikTok, everyone watching, if you're on TikTok, <laughs> if you have a particular interest or something that you, you like, you click like for, the TikTok's um, uh, algorithm will have you seeing more of that same type of video. And what I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up is because when I got on TikTok about six months ago, I noticed a whole range of men who would have fooled me. And mm. I, it, it was, I had to show it to some of my friends. I'm talking about bearded, rugged, gruff <laughs> dudes, right? <laughs> who would, walking down the street would have fooled me. And I would be considered a bigot for going out on a first date, for example, finding out that the person was not, was born of a different gender and then saying, no, I'm not interested. That's considered bigotry nowadays. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm bringing all this up to say people who, who make those types of decisions um, with their bodies. Mm -hmm. And I've heard them say it just on TikTok and other forms of social media. They would say, why is the most high so fixated on genitalia? He created us. He should just let us enjoy the course of our lives. Why is he so fixated? And so, Moray, what would your response to that be? Um, God doesn't want us to be confused. God has given us all the tools we need, every single tool we need to make sure that we understand what everything is. And he's given us every tool we need, not to only understand who we are as far as male and female, but given us every tool that we need so that we understand who he is so that we don't confuse him with being a male or a female, right? He's God, we're flesh, and then there's the animals. And he even has done it in such a way that we understand who the angels are, right? And so I say that because God, God always leaves clues. We serve a God of mystery, but we don't serve a God of confusion. We don't always understand how he's done it, but we do understand that he's done it in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And so I say that because, you know, 
there will be people who tell you there is no God. There will be people who will tell you there's nothing wrong with, with you choosing whatever sexuality that you have because there's no such thing as perversion. However, there's a clear such thing as perversion, right? And all these things come into play. And I always warn us, do not allow people to blur the lines. You have people who purposely want to blur the lines so you can be confused on what you should and should not be doing. Don't allow people to blur the lines. Don't allow people to tell you, don't knock it until you try it. No, knock it because God said, don't try it. We know that one, don't, don't knock it until you try it. Oh, and you'll have people that'll be like, oh, I never thought I would be like this until I experienced. Well, guess what? God didn't say that you wouldn't like it. God said you would be wicked if you do it. Mm. Right? So I want us to understand this as we build and we grow. This is, this is not about us wanting to be bigots. And I'm not saying you were saying that, um, Eva. I'm saying that in the sense that if they see your algorithm and if you make one hit to something homosexual, yep. they're going to flood you with it. Yep. They're going to flood you with it because they think that's what you want to see. <laughs> right? And I, I, can, I can profess to my own timeline that the more I started like hitting on more Israelite things and Shabbat Shalom and liking certain things that Israelites were doing, the more they started introducing to me more Israelite stuff, different Israelites, suggesting friends that are Israelites that I don't know. And the next thing you know, they were suggesting to me Israelite music. And I found that to be very interesting because that means I can absolutely control what I see. They might try to drop a little bit in here and a little bit in there, and that's okay. But, you know, and I, and I tell us, and I still have time to make this statement, watch the Netflix special, The Social Dilemma. Mm. You'll yeah. see they are watching how much time you spend on certain things, where you comment at, all the different things going on. And I say all of that because if you see, if you stop and you read too long, and sometimes you're looking at some stuff that just seems amazing. You're like, I can't even believe that this is going on right now. Let me get off of this. And the next thing you know, you start seeing more stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So watch what you entertain. You know, I, I was told this before and I absolutely believe it. Watch who you let in. Because when you let people in, you let their demons in also. Can't have, can't have everybody in here. And I will say that God said he created us. He said, um, we said, and we're coming up on a portion soon, the portion of Balak, where it says, the children of Israel are a nation that should dwell alone. But Eva, I'm sorry, come on. Yeah, yeah. No, no, what you're, what you're saying is, is critical. And what it reminds me of is an arrow um, you know, the bow and arrow and the way that the head of the arrow is shaped um, mm -hmm. it comes to a point, but then it has those parts behind it. And it's like a sort of a triangle. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the reason it reminds me of that is that there's some things that you only need to expose yourself to once because it's, diff it's, it's challenging coming in. When somebody shoots an arrow at your chest, it'll come in and it's going to it'll hurt for a few seconds. But the more challenging part is trying to pull it out. Yes. That arrowhead is shaped. And yes. so when it comes to social media and the things we expose ourselves to, uh, some because we live in the information age, sometimes you just want to learn more and just become more exposed. But we also have to use discernment. Yes, yes, absolutely. And let me just tell you something about discernment. Sometimes we're looking at things, it's a little hard. We're like, is this too much or is it not? You know, I, I always say, I'm like, you, we work in society, you know, and I'm going to say this for what it's worth. 
don't be don't be confused that just because you serve God, that there aren't people who who serve God with you that not only break God's laws. But then you you think that there's never been a transvestite Israelite? I invite you to Facebook. I've seen it. I was just like, wait a second, what's going on here? And you can clearly tell that the person is a transvestite. You don't think that there's such thing as homosexual Israelites? I'm not saying that it's promoted. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but we see when we read the book of Judges that there were Israelites who were homosexuals. They were wrong, but those individuals were homosexuals. So don't think that they can't be transgender Israelites. And I want us to understand this too. We have to teach our children to go operate in a society where homosexuals are there. And guess what? Life, life doesn't end and you, you should not go around talking about, oh, you're homosexual and God is going to burn you and this, that, and other. No, 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 no. Yeah. This is who you are and this is who I am. And I have the right, I have the God-given right to teach my children and send them in a direction that I feel will be pertinent to their life being long on this earth. And if that's what you people do, that's fine. You have your thing and that's over there and that's how that happens. However, the way I teach my children, this is what we believe. This is my stance. This has nothing to do with the job that I work. This has nothing to do with when I go into the store and you know me purchasing who's, who's the cashier behind the register. This has all to do with us persevering and ensuring that we live a godly lifestyle and that we're not letting other people compromise our position with God. And that's what I think a lot of people miss. And once we get past that point, once we get past that point, because listen, you can't hide your children from everything. I think you got people out here now that think, you know, you're going to shelter your kid from all the outside world and all the things that are out there. And it's like, you're not sheltering your children from that. You're just robbing them from living a normal lifestyle and experience. They just need to know what to look out for. And so when we warn our children of the different things going on, and listen, it's not just children either. There's some adults, right? Mm -hmm. Some adults that's like, hey, you know, I, I say, and we're going to get on the, um, the relationship dilemma again which I'm probably going to invite um, a co-eva back on for because I know she has some some real, she she likes, you know, stuff like that. We got some other people in here. You just um, said my name. You just said my name. <laughs> <laughs> I said it's good. It's, it's one of those, it's like, listen, adults, adults become confused too, especially what, what do you do when your spouse or your partner says, I think I want to start dating the same sex. Mm -hmm. We pray that never happens. But what happens when that happens? Or you find out that your spouse is doing it. So I want us to keep that in mind. Um, final thought, Eva. Yeah, just, just one last thing. And, I, you know, this is a Torah study. So I just want to see if you have just one scripture for people to hold on to um, because we're swimming in a lot of shifting winds right now and people of faith want to have something that they can always refer back to that kind of determines how they'll be they'll behave in the midst of this mm -hmm. so when it comes to there, there are people who really think that gender identity that they're discovering and sexuality feels perfectly natural to them, mm -hmm. right? Um, that it feels perfectly natural to them. And, it, and I'm, it, they, they, they feel like, how can I be one thing and every single day I have to fight it, every single day. That's why I thank God that, you know, this is not my personal issue. And I'm, I know that you yeah. are yours because every day you have to fight urges and fight, you know, against what, how you're feeling and what feels natural to you. So for people who are experiencing that, 
and people who are in, in relationship, friendships, parenthood of people who experience that, what sort of uh, scripture can they hold on to um, that, will, that will really give them uh, encouragement in the midst of it? Sure. And I'm going to put this scripture up on the screen. For those of you who have your scriptures and you're out, please turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 29. Give me a second to share my screen here. Mm -hmm. Um, As we go over here to share, I'm going to share my screen with that, and I'm going to share that tab. And I'm going to take down this banner so we can read it. Mm -hmm. And let me highlight it. So the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 29, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Behold, this only have I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. I like that verse. Keep it. Walk with it. Hear that. God, God gave us everything that we need. We needed. God didn't create us, and He was like, "Okay, now, now you go figure it out." God made us upright, but we sought out what? Many inventions. Inventions. Mm-hmm. We 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 create these things. We do these things a certain way, and the way that we do these things, and I want us to keep this in mind, brothers and sisters. The way that we do these things, there's such a level of confusion that when it's time for us to climb out of it, it's hard. Because you know what? Uh, Uncle so-and-so was like this. Aunt so-and-so was like this. Grandfather so-and-so was like this. This person was like this. That person was like this. Oh, there's nothing wrong with this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I say this all the time. I say, it's it's a okay when it's not in your household. Then when it comes in your household, you begin to question what you did wrong. Make sure you understand what you want and make sure you also understand what God wants and make sure the two have aligned. Hoping and praying that y'all got something out of what I said, that y'all enjoyed the Torah study this evening. And I bid you all in the time of our forefathers, Shabbat Shalom. I ask that you all uh, hang out with me just for a few more minutes as I make a couple of good announcements. Um, The first thing, um, sisters will be glad to see. Um, We're the Keepers of the Covenant, July 22nd, 2022. Um, The sisters will be having a praise and worship Torah study. A praise and worship Torah study. Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath Praise Yahweh. Glorify the name of Yahweh with us as we bring in the Shabbat day with prayers, with songs, with poetry, with scriptures, and testimony. We all need a little inspiration, so let us inspire you. Um, what I am going to say, and I want us to keep in mind, um, if you want to join us for that Torah study, and again, the sisters will be having that Torah study, then reach out to Ako Yakia. You can reach out to myself. Say, yes, I do want to be part of this Torah study. I do have some poetry. I do have a psalm I want to read. I do have a testimony. That will be that Torah study that week. Again, that will be July 22nd, 2022, which is a quote-unquote Friday at 7 p.m. Also, brothers and sisters, please join us tomorrow. Congregation Shomay Habrit, the spiritual journey awaits. Um, join us for our Sabbath service at 9 a.m. We will be doing a Torah portion of Korah, right? Um, the teachers tomorrow will be myself and my brother Maury Shia, all the way fresh off a vacation. He'll be he'll be teaching us from another country, but he'll have some great words for us, as he usually does. Also, brothers and sisters, our scripture of the week. Please write it down. Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse seven, which is. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all peoples.
That is your scripture of the week. And lastly, brothers and sisters, um, the Shomrei Habrit Food Pantry will be in two weeks, July 21st, 2022. Please mark it down on your calendar. Actually, almost three weeks at this point. Um, from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m., we do have our date, 1568 Prospect Place, Brooklyn, New York, 11233. Shomrei Habrit in conjunction with the works of Angel's Hands. Please come out. Please volunteer. Please, if you need food, come and get yourself some food and feed your family. Grocery should not be a need for anybody in our nation. I pray that everyone had um, a fulfilled Torah study. Um, we pray, and I say this in all sincereness, that we haven't offended anybody and that we weren't being insensitive to anybody's personal issues. If we have offended anyone, we take the time now to apologize because the intent is not to offend. However, we will speak our truth according to what we understand God to be doing with us. I ask that the Most High God continue to bless you all. Please like, share, and subscribe to the Shomri Habri channel. I'll see you all in the morning at 9 a.m. Please tell a friend to tell a friend, and let's serve God together. Lala told the camp.